This message comes to you from King's Church Wirral, UK. We hope that as you listen, you will be encouraged, blessed and inspired. Hi and welcome to King's Church Wirral. You join us as we continue our series at looking at the book of Joshua. If you are joining us for the first time, in order to bring some context to the story and teaching so far, I would recommend that you listen to the earlier episodes in this series and hope you find them a real encouragement. Today I'll be continuing uh, the story of the nation of Israel's journey in Joshua chapter 5. But as a quick recap, the previous chapter saw Israel having crossed the Jordan River following God's instructions uh, given to their leader Joshua to choose 12 men one from each of the represented tribes of Israel, to stop and gather 12 stones from the riverbed where the priests had stood. These stones were then placed as a permanent landmark, a monument for future generations to the goodness, faithfulness and provision of their God. It will be a permanent reminder to their children's children of the deliverance that God had brought by holding back the waters of the Jordan River while the whole nation crossed over to the land promised by God to their ancestor Abraham. So we continue the story this week by reading from Joshua chapter 5 starting at verse 1. Now when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until they had all crossed over. Their hearts melted in fear and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gibeath Haraloth. Now this is why he did so. All those who came out of Egypt, all the men of military age, died in the wilderness on the way after leaving Egypt. All the people that came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the wilderness during the journey from Egypt had not. The the Israelites had moved about in the wilderness for 40 years until all the men who were of military age, when they left Egypt, had died, since they had not obeyed the Lord. For the Lord had swore to them that they would not see the land that he had solemnly promised to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. So he raised up their sons in their place, and these were the ones that Joshua circumcised. They were still uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in camp until they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the place has been called Gilgal to this day. On the evening of the fourteenth day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they had ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate the produce of Canaan. Now, in terms of military uh, intelligence, this report in these opening verses of chapter five would have been music to the ears of any advancing army. God's supernatural provision and intervention in stopping the Jordan's waters while they crossed had served to destroy the morale of the inhabiting nations as they heard the reports of Israel's advancement into the land. Due to the time of year of Israel's arrival at the river border, these Amorite and Canaanite kings would have presumed that they had an extended period of time to plan a strategy and prepare their military forces while the river was at its highest level, as these seasonal floodwaters cascaded down the Jordan Valley. Uh, from the high ground in the north of the country. But this expected breathing space for the Canaanites to plan their defence strategy had evaporated as the God of Israel held back the river water as a sign of his sovereign power. 
from a military perspective, seeing this massive psychological blow to the morale of the inhabiting people groups would have probably increased the Israelites' enthusiasm to move swiftly and attack. But as we're reminded through the prophet Isaiah in chapter 55, God's thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. So just as God has, in, has instructed, Joshua uh, paused after the crossing of the Jordan to stop and place 12 stones as a landmark and a monument of his goodness uh, for future generations to see. God again at this time instructs Joshua to stop and pause. But on this occasion, it is not to remember the crossing of the river, but to remember the neglected covenant of circumcision that God had established with their ancestor Abraham. To give this event some context, I'm going to read from Genesis chapter 17, which gives us the origins of this covenant between God and Abraham and his future descendants. And this is reading from Genesis 17. Starting at verse one, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and I will greatly increase your numbers. Abraham fell face down and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will, will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between uh, me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give you as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Then God said to Abraham, as for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, for the generations to come. And this is my covenant with you and your descendants after you. The covenant you are to keep every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So we see here the origins of this covenant of circumcision. God was making it very clear to Abraham that for him and his descendants to be beneficiaries of the promises of the covenant, it would require an attitude of faithful obedience. And we see this echoed in the instructions given by God to Moses for the nation on stone tablets in Exodus chapter 20, verse 2, where it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. God was re-emphasizing the, the requirements of the covenant made with Abraham, where he says, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Now we can see in the life of Abraham, even after this encounter with God, that he still made some bad decisions and poor life choices because he was human. But God places expectations on Abraham to live a life worthy of this covenant relationship that he has invited him to be a part of. Abraham wasn't sinless and perfect, but the covenant that God had made with him meant that he expected Abraham to center every aspect of his life around honoring him. So here in Joshua chapter, chapter 5, God calls for a re-establishing of this covenant that he made with Abraham. A re-establishing of covenant with this new generation of his pe people before they went into battle. Before combat and conquest, there was a need for consecration. 
consecration meaning a commitment and dedication to the calling of God. This circumcision process was to be an outward sign of an inner commitment to God. It was a physical demonstration of obedience in the life of the nation of Israel as a signpost pointing towards what God was to do, it wanted to do in their hearts, a call to follow him wholeheartedly. We can see this continuity of purpose from the language that God uses earlier in their history in Deuteronomy chapter 10, where Moses writes in verse 12, And now is Israel, what does the Lord God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. To the Lord your God belong, belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth and everything in it. Yet the Lord has set his affection on your, uh, on you, your ancestors and loved them. And he chose you, their descendants above all the nations, as it is today. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome. Circumcise your heart and do not be stiff-necked, or do not be stubborn. Now, you can't physically circumcise your heart, but the imagery used here uh, through the writings of Moses is the cutting away of anything that would prevent this wholehearted commitment to God. Circumcision is a physical symbol of a spiritual reality that honours and reveres God over everything that could detract from that priority of commitment. So circumcision of the heart is a symbolic reference to what God wants to do in the lives of those who trust him. So what does that mean for us as followers of Jesus? Circumcision of the heart is allowing the Holy Spirit to pinpoint those sinful and destructive attitudes that need to be cut away in our lives. This will only happen as we allow God's Spirit to speak to us. And as we allow his word to guide us and instruct us, it's trusting God that he has the best plan for our lives, which is confirmed to us when we read in Jeremiah 29 verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And this week's chapter is a vivid example of trusting God's word. Joshua and the nation of Israel are within striking distance of the fortified city of Jericho. The morale of the city's inhabitants is at an all-time low, and there appears to be no better time to advance. However, God's instruction to Joshua is to trust him wholeheartedly by making him and the entire nation completely and utterly dependent and reliant on, on his protection. How? by instructing Joshua to temporarily incapacitate the entire male population through circumcision. It would be a sign of them re-establishing their covenant with God and their total reliance and trust on him. This act of obedience would render the entire nation vulnerable to attack from the city. And as I said earlier, before the time of combat and conquest, there needs to be a time of consecration the commitment and dedication of the entire nation to trust God with their lives. God had shown himself faithful when they were totally vulnerable as they crossed the Jordan on dry ground while he held back the full force of the water. And now, due to the same display of sovereign power, the full force of the armies of Canaan were held back as the courage of the Canaanites evaporated with the news of this miraculous event. So now Israel waited on the plains of Jericho in their vulnerable condition, all the while trusting God to protect them. The act of circumcision resulted in a total dependency on God. The Israelites had come to a place of surrender and obedience before they moved on into the land that he had promised to give them. God's priorities became their priorities. They were totally dependent on God for the protection. They chose the path of obedience and he rewarded them for it. God had, a, had given specific instructions 
about the regulations associated with celebrating the Passover. These were received by Moses and Aaron in Exodus 12, verse 48, and stated that no uncircumcised male could celebrate the Passover. So Israel's priority there at Gilgal was to please God by honouring and obeying his instructions. God's response was protection of the nation in their time of weakness and vulnerability. Israel's willingness to align herself in obedience to God's instructions and guidance 40 years earlier in Egypt resulted in their release from captivity after the first Passover. Now the nation is able to celebrate the Passover again, this time the land that God had promised to give them, due only to her willingness to align herself in obedience to God's instructions and guidance. The relationship between God and his people has been restored as God tells Joshua that the reproach of Egypt has been rolled away. Reproach can be described as the expression of disapproval and disappointment at someone's actions. And the name Gilgal is similar to the Hebrew verb galal, which means to roll or to roll away. Possibly why a number of Bible historians speculate that the, the landmark of stones placed at Gilgal were in a circle or a wheel formation to tie in with this imagery of God rolling away the reproach of Egypt from Israel. These stones meant that Gilgal became a place of remembrance for the Israelites of the goodness and faithfulness of their God who had brought them out of captivity in Egypt and across the Jordan into the land of promise. But as well as a place of remembrance, it also became a place of restoration due to the nation's obedient commitment to cut away the things of the past and restore and renew their relationship with God. This Old Testament account of the crossing of the Jordan and entering the promised land, as well as being an historical event, is a picture of the pathway of the spirit-filled life that God is calling believers to follow in the New Testament. God's plan and purpose has always been to have a community of people for himself who trust and obey him and who reflect his nature and character to the world and represent him well. Just as God instructed their ancestor Abraham to walk before him faithfully, and be blameless, he then instructed the nation of Israel at Gilgal to symbolically cut away the rebellious and destructive attitudes of the past in order to restore their covenant relationship with him. The Apostle Peter conveys the same instruction to followers of Jesus, and I'm reading from 1 Peter 1 verse 14. As obedient children, do not conform to evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. As Christians, we believe that our relationship with the Father can only be restored through our belief and trust in the redemptive work of his son Jesus on the cross. Jesus said of himself in John 14 verse 6, I am the way that, and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. For the Christian, the work of the cross of Jesus and all that it entails, his crucifixion, his death, his burial and his resurrection is the fulfilment of God's plan to restore the broken relationship between God the creator and his creation. The symbolic significance of the events of Gilgal and the Im imagery of it being a place of remembrance and restoration point forward along the same pathway of reconciliation to Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. When we remember the cross of Jesus and his sacrifice, we remember it as a place of our restoration, a place of reconciliation with our creator. The cross was the place where the sin of mankind was rolled away for all who put their trust in Jesus as their saviour and Lord. It's impossible to live a life that pleases God in our own strength. We need to rely on the Holy Spirit and the word of God to guide us and transform us as we commit to a, pro to a process of continually circumcising our hearts and aligning our lives with his plans and purposes. Thanks for listening.
We hope that you've been blessed by this message. If you have any questions or comments, please contact us at www.kingschurchwirral.co.uk.